First, I thank you for uh, inviting me here. Uh, for me, it is a kind of co-invitation from, from Minsk, from Vilnius, uh, perhaps Kaunas too, uh, the places where I have been before, and I see a lot of good friends here, and I'm very happy to uh, see you again and to philosophize with you. Uh, what I offer is a piece of uh, phenomenology, what I call responsive phenomenology, a certain style of doing phenomenology, and uh, attention is not only a special phenomenon, but it is a kind of ouverture uh, into phenomenology from a certain point of view. Let me start with some uh, preliminary uh, remarks on attention. Uh, attention is certainly not one of the great and central issues of Western philosophy, such as uh, being, time, space, liberty, and subjectivity. When we are wondering why it is so, we come across certain weak points which are typical of the narrow perspective in which attention is traditionally regarded. Firstly, attention seems to be only a prepa pre preparatory step or kind of colon, we have nothing to do but to open our eyes and to pick our, up our ears and the rest will follow. That's not so much. Um, secondly, attention relies on something else. It may rely on certain volitions as in St. Augustine uh, or on our attempts to bring something to light or on the difference between being asleep and being awake. Thirdly, attention tends to be split into two opposite aspects, especially into the duality of acts and the mechanism of, a, uh, 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 and mechanism of attention, or the duality of activity on the one side, passivity on the other side, both in correspondence with the Cartesian dualism. Uh, on the whole, the idea of attention takes on a, some nomadic and hybrid features which prevent it from occupying a strong pos position. It is true, even traditional Western thinking includes philosophers like Plotinus, uh, St. August, Descartes, Locke, Malbranche, or Leibniz, who all see to attention its special place within the life of spirit, of consciousness, or of action. But we have to wait for a longer time until attention really counts. Only on the threshold of the 20th century, three great figures arise. That is to say, William uh, James, uh, the pragmatist, Ari Bexo in France, and finally, uh, Edmund Husserl. They all try to radicalize the theory experience in a new way. From the Lithuanian point of view, uh, I should mention two names uh, who have to do also with the topic of uh, attention. That's Aaron Govich, he was born in Kaunas, you know, and uh, the other is Emmanuel Levinas, as I will mention them in some context later. <coughs> uh, I will uh, unfold my, my reflection on uh, 10 sections. Some are very short, so it's not too long. Uh, the first uh, section, attention as an original fact. That's the starting point. The outstanding role we attribute to attention relies on certain presuppositions. At first sight, this looks uh, so much simple that they are usually taken for granted. The phenomenon of, of attention coincides with the following fact. Whenever something happens, or something appears, it is the case that rather this ha appears at not something else, and that it appears rather in this way and not in the other. That is a presupposition in general taken for granted and not, uh, not uh, noticed. At this crucial point, we are confronted with an example of what Goethe calls an original phenomenon, an urphenomen. I take attention as an urphenomen, original fact. What does it mean? Such an original fact should not be confused with any kind of principle from which certain statements or proposal may be derived. It is original insofar as it constitutes the inevitable starting point for canonical questions, for canonical questions such as what is it, who I am, 
who are you, why it is so. Original facts stir up such questions even before we are able to describe and define what is going on there. So it's something before we put these canonical questions. Take, for example, a, a sudden noise outside, an explosion, a stroke of lightning, a traffic accident in the streets, a stabbing pain, or some anomalous phenomenon in the sky. Or take an unexpected idea coming into your mind, that is to say, an invention in its literal sense. In German, we call this Einfall. Uh, Einfall, what literally means, some uh, them falling in or an invasion. And in French, it's l'idée qui vient, an idea which is coming. That is an event, that something is coming or not. And finally, they take what in the fine arts or in religion is called inspiration. Such a kind of breathing in does not exclude plenty of efforts and skills. By no means should it be confused with a nebulous mysticism, but whatever may awake our attention, we can only afterwards raise the question as to what was it that frightened, astonished, and surprised us in such an extraordinary way. That's what I say, the original phenomenon. We start from this Einfall idea with some explosion. We start when you ask what it is. You know the, the, the classical Greek question is always, what is it? And, uh, and this Nietzsche is saying, when you ask what it is, you are always on the step of metaphysics. You presuppose a field of of, uh, of determined determination, you can always say what it is. But uh, this, the question is not, not what it is, something coming out just to, to arising this question uh, and not starting from this. So much about the starting point, and now uh, it's the central point, something about attention himself. For, uh, the second section is attention as a double and intermediary event. A minimal description of attention close to what minimal arts performs by colors and lines would look as follows. I am struck by, in German, es fällt mir auf, uh, and on the other side, I take notice of, ich merke auf. Auffallen, aufmerken, two words in, in, in German, and uh, when I have written the book on phenomenology of attention, I wanted to give the title Auffallen and, and Aufmerken, but the lector of the publish house said, which it sounds too, too strange, so I said, phenomenon of attention. But I'm really, what I mean is attention is uh, two events, uh, uh, something stri striking us and taking notice of this. Uh, this uh, simply looking description needs to be explained. It includes a series of constitutive aspects, and I want just to explain this double event. The first part of the double event, which consists in something becoming conspicuous, as auffallen, has to be characterized in terms of something happening to me, of something touching or affecting me. I call this happening pesos, which in Greek means three events, three uh, things uh, at once. The first passive voice, the suffering, and the passion, all this pesos in Greek. We are faced with an event uh, into which each of us is involved, but not in terms of the nominative case, I am looking or I am observing, not in, the case, in terms of the nominative case, uh, but rather in terms of the dative or accusative case, referring to me as to somebody concerned or addressed. Again, uh, something is striking me, I am uh, in, involved, but not in the nominative, I am looking at, but I am uh, I'm involved in the form of the accusative or the dative. Even Levinas referring to was, me voici as the accusative, which is more original than the nominative where I start from uh, my own uh, origin. The second part of the double event has to be understood uh, as a sort of response. The pathos is what's coming to us, and the response is uh, our way of going to things themselves. The response is giving or given or refused by somebody um, 
and uh, is, is given by somebody, and responsive saying and doing does not coincide with what is said or done in terms of an understandable answer. A responding means an event uh, which merely happens and this event gets transformed into a speech act or into a practical action. I may respond by saying something, by uh, performing a speech act or by doing something, giving something, the water, when I'm asked for water, I can give, give it as a kind of an action I'm doing, but responding means more. It's just taking up a request coming from the other side. Uh, let me give a simple example to show what is at stake when you respond to things. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, how late it is it? Uh, and the answer, uh, the three o'clock. Or I could answer, uh, look yourself on the, on the watch. I, I could review the answer too. Uh, but a simple answer, and uh, I, I answer, by giving the answer, I respond to the other's demand. That is more what I said, but it's just to responding to the other's demand. That sounds rather simple. It ceases to be trivial if something important is at stake. I mean something which is not only recorded as something usual, but which opens a new page in the book of history, as it happens with singular events such as somebody's birth, or the outbreak of war and revolution. These are big events, which are not events, typical events in a certain field of, uh, of uh, history, but a breakthrough, a new way of history, of my personal or common history. So much about the Pacers, what is happening to us, and the response just to go in the direction of what is coming. Now the third aspect, uh, the event of attention presents itself as a double and intermediary event crossing a threshold which simultaneously joins and separates, like the hyphen, the Bindestrich. On the one hand, the threshold joins. There is no pathos without somebody to whom it happens, whether it may be a case of pleasure, of pain, of joy, or of sorrow. A, a pain without somebody who has to feel the pain would be nothing like a fantasy. Uh, the pathos all refers to something, uh, something being uh, concerned by things. Vice versa, there is no respond, a response without something to which or somebody to whom it responds. Responding means a very simple. Responding means to speak to something already said. Uh, it's never a start. I make a, uh, make a statement. Uh, responding means start from the other side, something which is already uh, a demand. Uh, this uh, uh, threshold, uh, uh, threshold joins, but on the other uh, the threshold between both events separates. One moment cannot be derived from the other. What we discover is not only a difference of qualities, but a difference of direction. Something or somebody is coming to me or going away from me. Movement and counter-movement cannot be integrated like parts into a whole. Consequently, they both resist to the totalization or reconciliation accomplished by Hegelian dialectics. There is no dialect between uh, striking and, uh, being, and responding, because there's a split between both. The fact that something is happening to us excludes two kinds of extreme. It excludes uh, any sort of foundationalism which would presume that our response is already included in what it is given. In what is given. Answers have to be invented. Answers have to be invented, they are not pre-given as something ready-made. However, excluded is as well any sort of constructivism which would pretend that there is nothing to respond to but only some material out of which something has to be made. Constructivism in its different variants uh, falls back onto a sort of doing which forgets its own presupposition and its own motivations. Uh, so the two extreme, the foundationalism ex uh, and constructivism, just avoids this between both, between pathos and response. Uh, the gulf between pathos and response goes together 
with the so-called subject splitting into the double figure of patient and respondent. Uh, now the question, where is the subject? In, is, is the subject of responding something of, of, of being concerned? Uh, 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 once in, in, in my, my life, uh, like Descartes, I stopped speaking of subject, I only quote it because when I discuss with my uh, colleagues, I have to mention uh, the subject, but I never uh, use it in my own way because it is not, uh, there are not subjects, subject is a function. But what is going on, what I call the self, I'm implied in experience, but not as a subject, but rather in the double way of patient respondent, because on the other side, uh, we become uh, both being affected and responding, see as two uh, movements, uh, but they never completely coincide. At this point, uh, the split of the self, uh, I'm respondent and uh, 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 and patient at once. At this point, responsive phenomenology crosses the path of Freudian psychoanalysis and its continuation by authors like Lacan and Laplanche. Provided that our experience starts with what is happening to us, assuming a patient-like role, we ha will never be sovereign masters of ourselves. Consequently, Paraphenomena like the unconsciousness or the involuntary must not be qualified as mere failures of knowing and willing, but as an original sort of experience to be qualified uh, by different terms as withdrawal in German, Entzug, uh, as an absence, Abwesenheit, briefly as experience of what is alien to us. Even the unconscious in the state of Freud is not a deficiency of knowing, but it's an absence, it's a hold, something which withdraws of our own knowing and, uh, and doing. Uh, the force of our creativity appears as a reversal of an original and internal weakness. The weakness being affected by us, as it's a certain weakness and the strongness is just how we respond to that. In sum, the event of attention is neither a collage of outer mechanism and internal acts, nor a scale leading continuously from passivity to activity. On the contrary, this strange event is carried on by a radical kind of passivity. But there's a special sort of passivity introduced by Husserl and radicalized by Levinas and others or by Eastern uh, practices of meditating or releasing, um, this kind of uh, original passivity is not the counterpart of our own activity and not only a diminished degree of activity. If you take the great tradition of Aristotle, uh, the God is the pure energia, action in a certain sense, and passivity is only a diminished form of passivity. But when we start from this situation where something is striking us, this passivity is not a failure, it's not a deficiency, but is a starting point. It's an original form of passivity which cannot be reduced to any form of, uh, of uh, activity. Respond, responding means to start from elsewhere, from what is alien to us. That is my most simple definition of responding, or what does responding mean? Uh, I'm doing something, I'm speaking or uh, managing something, but in any case, I start from elsewhere. That's the most elementary definition of response. It's not my initiative. I start from elsewhere even when I answer myself. Um, now the third section, uh, attention as a temporal displacement. The double event of attention opens a new chapter in the great book of time. It is subjected to a particular kind of temporality. Uh, we mentioned uh, the two movements of being affected by and responding to. Both are separated from each other by a sort of displacement or time lag, which I call diastasis, uh, in Greek diastasis, uh, the ancient uh, term uh, is, uh, is to be found in Aristotle or in Plotin, uh, and it means uh, stepping apart or uh, stepping outside each other. Dias, that's not ecstasis, going outside. Dias is going uh, aside, uh, myself. Uh, and uh, I call it a displacement or time lag in German. Eine, 
eine Zeitverschiebung, eine Zeitverschiebung, original Zeit mit Time Lake. Uh, I'm not completely uh, at home in the present. Um, uh, the diastasis has to be understood in a temporal spacious sense. Being here and now, we are elsewhere too, and this in a paradoxical way, paradoxical way. Whatever happens to be uh, uh, to me comes too early. That's a very simple description of what is going on. The surprise is always too early. When it's not too early, then it's not surprise. And now I'm uh, something happening, what already is known. Uh, uh, it's meet always something uh, which comes too early, whereas my response comes too late. Uh, we are confronted with an original kind of anteriority in German. Vorgängigkeit and a, a, an original kind of posteriority in German Nachträglichkeit. Uh, Freud uses this term even in his description of the traumatism. Coming too early, uh, coming too late must not be confused, uh, uh, confused with simply coming earlier or later as if there were two events occupying sequent positions on a continuous scale of time. We have the, the, the error of time and the line as something first and the others as, as succeedance one after the other. But what is going on here, uh, that is not something first and then the it. It's not first the pain and then my, 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 my crying. Uh, in the beginning, I am uh, participate in the beginning, but not uh, 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 as something which comes back to his own origin. Uh, um, regarded from the participant's point of view, each of us is at once uh, older and younger than himself or herself. Um, that sounds like Derrida or some postmodernists, but this can be found in Plato in his uh, reflection on what is going on in time. In the dialogue Parmenides, he says, everything in time is uh, older and younger than itself. Literally, that's not Derrida, that's only Plato. Because uh, I'm now what I'm now being. I've been, I have been some been something or some before. Uh, I'm not completely now and here, but I'm already somebody. He was uh, elsewhere when he started. Uh, so much uh, that was uh, the nucleus of my uh, theory of attention. Now uh, a series of comments. Uh, the next is. Uh, attention as selection that has to do uh, with the organization of experience where the attention is working uh, in organizing the experience. There is no event of attention without a certain selectivity. A turning to, uh, in German Zuwendung, uh, turning to something means at the same time turning away from something else. Zuwendung, Abwendung are two aspects of the same thing. This uh, to and fro of movement, uh, which in German is rendered by Zuwendung, Abwendung, uh, correspondence to the double process too. <clears throat> this process, uh, this sort of preference, uh, doing this and not that, corresponds to the privileged forms introduced by the theories of Gestalt, and this in contrast to any sort of panorama which claims to see everything at once. Uh, the panorama, to see everything at once, see, means uh, seeing nothing. You could always say in Greek, the pan akusma, the, uh, to hear everything. Uh, just when I came here, I was sitting in the reception at my hotel, and there was music. Uh, all over the one hour, only music. That was a pan akusma. It was all of, without end. Uh, but I didn't listen to this. This was just like a noise in the background. And if you see, hear everything or see everything, you see nothing. Uh, so it's only like a noise in the background. And so uh, attention has to be selective to take this or not that. Otherwise, there would be nothing discovered uh, by attention. <coughs> this process of selection uh, resists, again, to certain extremes. <coughs> On the one side, it resists to a realistic interpretation, which takes attention as a simple process of picking out something that is already given. You find this idea in, in Hume, uh, Hume by uh, you pick out something, some ideas just which are interested in. Then things are already there. You only pick out what is already there. On the other side, selection resists to a subjectivist interpretation in the manner of Wilhelm Bund against whom 
Husserl was arguing. This founder of experimental psychology counts attention among the normal facts of consciousness, taking it, I quote, wound as a mere state characterized by peculiar sentiments which accompanies the clear apprehension of a psychological content. That was the great uh, Wilhelm Wundt, the school of Leipzig, uh, who was a, the, big, the maker of psycholo modern psychology. Even the American came there in, at the time. Um, uh, and uh, it was the adversary of, of, uh, uh, of Husserl, not only adversary, but but is it the simplification. Everything, what is attention? You see something, and there's something uh, else, something in your soul going on, some nerves, some tensions, only accompany and they have nothing to do with things themselves. And what Husserl tries to show, attention has to do with things, things themselves and not with, only with some psychological process in the background. Um, uh, and so uh, for, for Husserl and others, phenomenologists, uh, selectivity is not a marginal phenomenon. It pertains to the organization of our experience as revealed and described uh, by phenomenologists. Uh, once uh, again, the monotony, monotony of seeing everything at once would amount to seeing nothing. And to hear everything at once would mean uh, hear nothing. Uh, the organization of experience means usually this or that and a certain preference within experience. That is not psychology, that things themselves. Something comes out and others are in the background. But now the fifth uh, section, attention as a creative sort of responding. Attention uh, does not consist of special contents, but of certain modes, modes of being given and of achieving acts, which Husserl calls gegebenheitsweise and vollzugsmodus. These modes of experience uh, do either exist in the outer world of physical things and processes, nor do they exist in the inner world of mental state acts and mental states. As the attention is neither if you take the great alternative. It is either physical or psychological. This just starts with the empiricist, always the inner world, the outer world. But attention has not only to do with something in your soul, that you, the physics cannot find attention in when it measures the, the nature, but it is something going on between some person with experienced things and things themselves. It's between uh, both. Um, uh, now, where is the creation? Uh, the attention is creative, creative uh, and eventive in this sense that uh, a, a field is organized <coughs> by our experience and something which is undetermined is determined. Um, Husserl already emphasized the undetermined as, a, as he says, the foggy or the nebulous and the sketchy as ingredients of our experience. Uh, this undeterminacy is like the sort of experience. When everything would, would be determined from the beginning, there would be no new experience at, uh, at all. Uh, experience, new experience start from a certain undeterminacy which is determined. That is the way, as uh, like uh, Meloponte describes attention. And uh, again, Aaron Grovich, uh, he has written this good, uh, oh, yeah, I, I hope you will read it here in this Lithuania too. I don't know ever, whether it is translated in this scene. Uh, the field of consciousness. Uh, this great book is translated in, the, in French, uh, after that in German, first in English. Uh, first in French, uh, and uh, it is a great book, The Field of Consciousness. There he, come, uh, he develops the phenomenology very close to the Gestalt theory. There is a question of selection, of relevancy, uh, how uh, experience is modeled uh, and things come out in, in different ways. Um, now, as a sixth, uh, sixth uh, a section, uh, Beyond Sense and Rule. A creative extension refers, uh, uh, extension refers to a special dimension of experience that we characterize as, uh, as pathic or responsive. These are the adjectives I used. Um, what takes place here on a, a deeper level, on the level of pathos and response, precedes and exceeds every sort of sense and rules. It goes beyond intentionality and regularity. 
uh, that is a kind of distance to the great currents in, in, in active contemporary philosophy, uh, phenomenology in the classic sense, or hermeneutics, that's the question of sense, of intentionality, or understanding. Uh, analytical philosophy is a question of rules, of regularity. But attention is beyond sense and uh, regularity. It, is, it, gets, uh, it goes much deeper. Deeper than uh, whatever strikes us or affects us does not possess in advance any sense and does not in advance follow any rule. It only it gets certain sense and a certain regu regularity by the creativity of our answers. There's a question about why in metaphysics attention doesn't play a certain role. It, it presupposes a process of changing the order. If everything is all given there and you have only to find out, uh, attention has not much to do. So the sense is already in the things themselves. But a, a contingency of phenomenology means that something is discovered. What has not a sense rule from the beginning, but it becomes senseful and, uh, and ruled, within the process of experience. And this giving sense and uh, following rules is just the creativity of experience which is not pre-given. Now the seventh, uh, seven, uh, uh, seven, um, the seventh uh, section, uh, incorporated attention. Now I want to say something about attention and body and technology. Attention is not exhausted by momentary fulgurations. It gets incorporated into a set of structures and habits. Considering the, the, parts, uh, the part of objects and aims, we discover striking features, in German I say Auffälligkeiten, striking features, which by means of repetition produce a world of marks, marks and effects, which reminds us of the Merkwelt and Wirkwelt in Uxkul's biology. Again, another author from your Baltic countries. Uxkul was read by Husserl, Heidegger, Scheler, and all this. And he speaks of Merkwelt, the world of Marx and effects, and the world is structures in the sense I, not only things are there, but things are marked uh, as being seen uh, or uh, by uh, our doing. Uh, passing over to the part uh, of subjective behavior, we come across habits and dispositions which constitute a certain readiness of attention. Uh, the German psychologists uh, use the term Aufmerksamkeitsbereitschaft. This is not only, not only a momentaneous act, but a certain readiness, certain habit of being attentive. Uh, this formation of attention plays a special role in the professional world of medical diagnosis or detective flair. I only pick up the example of drug search. How does, there is an example I find in the newspapers, uh, how does, uh, I think sometimes phenomenologists or philosophers should uh, look into the newspapers even when looking for examples. They are much more better often than invent, uh, examples invented by our colleagues. Um, uh, as I took this, this example of a drug research, how does the searcher find out which person in the airport carries drugs, drugs with him or her? One tells the story of an especially clever, clever searcher who directs his attention to everyone who is looking around in a fearful manner. Such people are looking like that. Uh, uh, I'm not not sure of myself, such people betray themselves by suggesting that they have something to hide. This uh, is an example of becoming striking, auffällig, uh, as we say in German. Uh, in German, this uh, word is used by medicine. Uh, there may be the traces of the face, red in the face may be, uh, auffällig may be a sign of a certain fever or is a crimin in the criminality, auffällig that some person behaves uh, 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 in this way like the dog, dog searcher. The constitution of a world of attention, uh, which our examples uh, uh, demonstrate, has certain uh, implications and consequences. First, we must distinguish between, between a primary, innovative, attention and a secondary normal form of attention. In the first case, the primary or innovative uh, attention, P 
people are exposed to what surprises, astonish, or frightens uh, them, whereas in the second case, they are seeing or hearing what they already know to some extent. Attention uh, becomes trivialized as long as we neglect this distinction. Consequently, imperatives like pay attention or simply attention would be completely reduced to a mere stuffing of our everyday life, although there are always more than that. The sort of behavior we call mechanical uh, will never be merely mechanical. It is more or less mechanized. Uh, there we have a sort of mechanic, mechanical repetition. So the learned keep smiling. Uh, I only know from the United States, I must say, it's, uh, it's, we try to learn it, but uh, that doesn't succeed so much. So the learned keep smiling may indeed turn into the frozen smile of Marilyn Monroe presented by Warhol in a quasi-mechanical way. But it's the mechanization of smile. Not, uh, smile is never mechanical. Um, now the double process of stabilizing by structures and habits which uh, does not cease to determine our attention leads us to an intermediary sphere of practices, techniques, and medias. Uh, that's for me very important just to find a place for techniques and medias. It's the intermediary sphere between objects and uh, between subjective acts. This sphere is crowded with guards, monitors, and alarm, uh, alarm, uh, alarm bells, and includes modes of watchful, watchful behavior creating a culture of attention which varies, which varies from one culture to the other. Uh, to be the professional in the museum, there is a guard. He has to be attentive, but it's a professional, professional attentive. He doesn't invent, so uh, discover so much things. He has to be present, but it's what quite called a normalized attention. It is profanized, even if it's profession. But this is in the background the current culture or profession of attention. Uh, hence, attention is shaped in various and contingent ways. Following Nietzsche, we may assume that humans, partly delivered from the chains of instinct, turn out to be a sort of not fixated animal, uh, nicht fixiertes, uh, uh, nicht festgestelltes Tier. It's a, a term of uh, by Nietzsche, used by Nietzsche, uh, nicht festgestelltes Tier, not fixated animal. Being overflowed by stimuli and attractions, uh, attractions, human attention needs certain modes of fixation which become part of our culture. Now, technology and economy of attention generates a heap of problems that I can only touch here. Take advertising, which is day by day struggling, struggling for our attention even courting for it, replacing the offered things by libidinous uh, baits. Uh, that's uh, advertising every day. The television is full of attention, uh, uh, a struggle for attention. The first, you know, we say, call it the, uh, the Einschaltquote, the, 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 the number of uh, uh, people just putting on the, the television. That you have one, some uh, listen to this. It is only the, the success is just to make people listen or look uh, to things. So the advertiser is a kind of trick, uh, a fight for inviting, for intention of, of people. And you know, it's, it's a, uh, it is a very uh, rare uh, wear because there are too many, even too many uh, sender, I see in, in English, uh, sender, um, uh, uh, what? Yeah, yeah, but it's so many, and they all fight for, for, for attention. Or take the politi politics, the prestige advertising of politicians is part of this kind of, uh, of advertising too. The image making of politics has to do with, you know, to awake uh, uh, attention. And I wonder why our Councillor Merkel is so many traveling. Uh, I have a, why, why? It's always there in Turkey and here and there. Why? Yeah, in television, it's always on the screen in the evening. And so uh, even the Foreign minister, he has, we have one, but he is always in the background. We know things, but Merkel, it is just to prepare the election of this fall. So it has to do with attention. It is not only a question of cognition and of, of practice of rules, it's just to fight for uh, attention. 
Uh, finally, all these attitudes and habits are rooted in our own body, which is at the same time, uh, some uh, remarks on our own body, the same at the time, the body is lived as life, as we say in German, and materialized as corpor, as the latter, including our brain. You know, we in German we say life and corpor, and in other language we have to make a, a, a distinction with the, the lift body and the, uh, the physiological or materialized uh, body. We say life and corpor, and both are coming together, and the brain is part of the physiological body, belongs to us too. Now, the neurologists uh, have discovered certain mechanism of reciprocal inhibition, which has to do with attention, uh, a reciprocal inhibition intervening within one and the same sense between the different senses or between thoughts and emotions. They help to reduce the complexity of our bodily life. In order to explore this incorporation of attention in all its facets and aspects, phenomenology needs to be complemented by a sort of uh, phenomenal technology. I took up this, uh, take, took up this uh, term from uh, Gaston Bachelard, the great epistemologist, French epistemologist. Phenomenal technique means that it's not only the logos, the word, and the, uh, the concept of phenomena, but there is always a certain technique, how we see things, how we listen to things, how we speak. There's a certain technique or technology even inside all these uh, experience which have their own quality. Uh, the the eighth, next point uh, turns to pathology of attention. I uh, speak of polarized, polarized, uh, polarized and blocked attention. Concerning the various possibilities and anomalies of uh, attention, we must consider the fact that the pathic and the responsive part of attention are seldom in a complete balance. Attention undergoes a certain destiny which manifests itself in multiple forms. So there's polarization. Uh, on the one side, we are inclined to practice, inclined to practice a certain laissez-faire. We let our senses, our thoughts, our desire roam, thus opening the door to special conducts. Reverie is a kind of daydream. Uh, uh, the, the term is used by Rousseau, by Locke, and Leibniz, even by Locke in French. Reverie is a kind of daydream. Uh, it takes place, that's Locke, in the antechamber of the ego. It's not the ego just looking for things, but the antechamber of the ego. Flannery, uh, I have to say it in French, uh, difficult to uh, uh, walking around uh, without a certain goal appears as a modern kind of leisure just to discover things. It animates the public life of modern cities as it is ac accurately described by writers like Charles Baudelaire or Walter Benjamin. Another uh, open the door is the brainstorming which is exercised in terms of a consciousness training which loosens the stream of th thoughts, taking distance from rigid ways of planning. But this is only the one side, uh, uh, open the door. On the other side, we get on the path of concentration, focusing on special tasks and putting aside everything that may disturb us. On the whole, our cultural traditions uh, oscillate between dispersion and collection mostly favoring the latter from the time of St. August up to now, uh, to now. In Eastern cultures, it is not the same. In Eastern cultures, traditional body practices like archery or spiritual exercises like Zen meditation constitute special schools of attention. We have shot to lose, not to, to, uh, to stick at the doing something, but to lose. However, uh, driven to extreme, both trends, uh, trends turn into pathology. Whereas extreme concentration leads to fixed ideas, edifix, the excess of distraction, distraction produces a flight of ideas uh, or uh, modern, modern troubles like uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity 
and now treat it in terms, I don't know, in your countries, we get sick now in English, or we get sick in English, so we call it ADC, that means Attention Deficit Syndrome, or ADHS, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Syndrome, and even the little children have ADC, they're not, sometimes they got nervous, they cannot sit still, but now they have ADS, this is all the clinic description, and we take up the, the medical uh, description. That is the kind, there are extremes uh, for this behavior, but not everything is clinic, which is not completely normal. And so it's even the problem of an over-medicalization of experience. Uh, so much about polar polarizing, there's a certain balance between two moments, dispersion and uh, con uh, concentration. Now the blockade that uh, uh, approximates the pathology the two wings of attention uh, which are uh, alternatively constituted by the event of being affected by and by the event of responding to can be torn asunder, they can be uh, separated. In the end, we reach extreme points where somebody is stroke without being able to respond, as in pacers without response. Uh, we encounter a phenomena like the shock by which our behavior is paralyzed, uh, precisely in such a way as Descartes describes it under the title of étonnement, astonishment. It's, it's a treatise of passions, and so it's a shock. You are like uh, fixed, uh, the fixed fixation of the body. You, you cannot react, you are unable to respond to this uh, shock. On the other side, we in confront uh, the extreme of responding without pathos. These are the stereotypes, uh, stereotypes that is to say solidified and petrified forms of response bar of any inquietude, inquietude and impulse. The later extremes, the stereotypes, is clearly illustrated by an example I take from literature, uh, by uh, it is uh, find, to be found in Herbert Melville's novel Bartleby, which has, uh, has commented by some authors like Deleuze and uh, Derrida, by myself too. Um, the, the, story, uh, uh, the, the, story, the story is the story of a scriber who someday suddenly refuses his service, repeating again and again uh, nothing more than, I would prefer not to. Nothing more. I would prefer not to. In using mere stereotypes, one approaches the death-like state of indifference in which everything is the same. Attention becomes extinct like a fire. That would be a good a provocation for every discourse theory. If I ask somebody from Frankfurt, what will you do with this battle? But he gives not arguments that I, I have no reason, just uh, I don't want to serve to you. Uh, you could say there's a contract, and then you are on the level of arguments but he doesn't ask. I would prefer not to refuse the response. This is a very extreme uh, form of, uh, of, uh, of uh, refusing as a, as a way of uh, responding. The final, the last point, is the trauma. Um, uh, uh, the trauma proves to be a particular grave, in the, uh, a grave uh, form of uh, um, impossibility of response. A trauma means a harmful, violent, a harmful, violent event which blocks every response and which shows up only afterwards in the indirect forms of symptoms. That is the view of, of, of Freud. He, uh, uh, there he uses the concept of Nachträglichkeit, of after, uh, reacting, responding afterwards of, to something which has only already happened. And there Freud uh, is referring to attention to, uh, as it's advice for the therapist, the therapist try to penetrate uh, the armor of the self-defense by method which Freud calls floating attention, gleichschwebende Aufmerksamkeit. He says you must not look what, uh, notice everything and pay attention, but uh, gleichschwebende Aufmerksamkeit means not to intervene, to uh, to leave things open, just coming out, things coming out which are not elaborated before by the patient or by the analyst. I shall skip only mention 
perhaps uh, you will miss something. Uh, that is the ninth section on directed attention. It has to do with sociality. I only mentioned it. Uh, don't go into the details because uh, attention doesn't only mean to pay attention to something, but uh, you always, there is always the question how attention is directed by the other. And to teach something means to direct the attention of the disciple. And so that's a further problem, but I shall skip this and come to the last point, uh, uh, attention and respect. And I show there are some ethical implications in the problem of attention. Um, attention is not only something to be managed and controlled, it is also something that we give or refuse and which we owe to each other. Hence, attention is not free of ethical impulses. We can gather some hints from the German language. In German, aufmerksamkeit, attention, aufmerksamkeit is closely related to achtung or achtsamkeit, which is uh, rendered in French, uh, in, in English, by respect. In French, the same. Respect has nothing to do with attention, but the German. Uh, uh, aufmerksamkeit, achtung, attention has something to do with uh, affinity on the list linguistic level. Um, in German, we say paying attention. Uh, it's different. English say paying attention. We pay attention. Uh, we say um, acht geben, yeah, to give more. So there are some connotations in, in different languages. But to take profit of these suggestions, we need uh, ethics from below. It is a sort of ethics which respects the other singular and situative demands before referring uh, to general norms. I call it a respect responsive ethics, uh, starting from the appeal or the demand or affection of the other, not from rules and from goals. Hence, attention turns out to be more than a cognitive achievement. It teaches us uh, certain lessons of an ethos of the senses. This basis, basic ethos uh, uh, emerges from the above mentioned acts of looking at and listening to, which contrast with acts of disregarding, of closing our eyes and our ears. In German, we have again two verbs, they are, they are very close. Uh, we can so uh, hinsehen, hinhören, to look at, uh, to listen to, and uh, übersehen, überhören, uh, wegsehen, weghören, to neglect, to look away. And it's very short in German, say, übersehen, uh, überhören. It is very, a very complicated process. Uh, to, to oversee something, you must see something, otherwise there would be nothing. Uh, oversee is a kind of repression of seeing. And uh, this morning I went to the Holocaust Museum. In the background, all these uh, innocent citizens around, I don't mean the policemen and the Gestapo uh, uh, functionaries, but many people looked away. They didn't, oh, they didn't see anything. And this is, uh, and so you see there's the ethic of, of, of senses. Ethic starts with looking to and pay attention to and not with uh, uh, apply certain rules and norms which are already pre-given. If, if you don't look, look to a situation, you are not in the embarrassed situation as to have to do something. It's, it's so uh, I think that is an elementary kind of ethics started, which starts, starts on, the, on the level of the senses. Even Husserl mentions a sort of, res, uh, he calls it responding looking and responding listening. In German, ein antwortendes Hinsehen und Hinhören. Hinsehen, hinhören, it's not only a cognitive process, but an addressing, it is referring to somebody else. Acts of disregarding by closing one's eyes and ears are a veritable part of our seeing and hearing, just as omission. For example, the denial of assistance in case of emergency is, of emergency is part of our acting. And this not only from the moral, but also from the legal point of view. Uh, in German, uh, uh, this is a legal term, uh, omission, uh, uh, unterlassen. It's, it's not only everyday word, unterlassen. You come in the street and something's happening there. You cannot say, I only looked. Uh, but you can say you should have done something uh, uh, as much as possible. Uh, but omission is a kind of action. To refrain from assistance is also an action. It's not only not doing nothing, 
uh, but it is to, to refrain from, from help, from assisting. As unterlassen is a kind of action, not, not only a negation of action, as even the, on the legal level, not only on the moral level. Um, uh, I refer to, uh, to a theorist uh, uh, communica of communica a science of communication, uh, Paul Watzlawick, the Austrian uh, author. He speaks of a kind of communica communicative trap which prevents us from not communicating. Uh, it's a very short, uh, short expression. He says, we uh, können nicht antworten. We are unable not to respond. If you are in a social situation, you can see anything, you can go out, you can keep silence, you can sing, everything. But you are trapped in the situation, you cannot not respond, but in a certain sense to participate on what is going on here between us. So it is not a question of good will or bad will, but you are in a situation, uh, whether you want or not, uh, you, are, uh, you are trapped, you cannot not uh, respond. Uh, I have taken up this in my theory of uh, response, uh, uh, it is a kind of practical necessi necessity or inevitability, a situation you cannot not respond. A, a, a simple example is, is look, if somebody asks you how late it is, you are in a trap, whatever you do, you are, you are you're responding. Even when you say, I don't want to look, ask another, that's not me, I'm not a functionary, also can, can do everything. But in any case, you respond. The situation creates a certain constrained, you are unable not to respond. It, it's a, a strange necessity. It's not against freedom, but the freedom uh, consists just in the possibility to, to respond and to invent a response and to do this way or that way. There is a freedom, but the starting point, uh, we don't invent to which we respond, we invent only what we give as response, but we don't uh, uh, invent uh, the starting point. Uh, I have in, in travel with a, in, in the debate with, uh, with Kentian, we call it uh, responsive freedom. Uh, a freedom we start by ourselves, as just Kant, fine Kant, we start by ourselves, but we start from elsewhere, because to which we respond is not invented by us, by freedom. Um, uh, now I come to the end. Uh, uh, I wa want to close a little bit with literature. Um, uh, I take some lines from poetry just to illustrate a little bit what is going on here with attention and respect. Uh, respect. Um, uh, and I take a, a poem uh, by, uh, by the British-American author Auden. The poem has a title, Musée des Beaux-Arts, this uh, museum in Brussels. And it is a reflection on his uh, visit of uh, a certain uh, painting by Bruegel, Bruegel uh, a famous painting uh, uh, where uh, uh, this painting Ovid falling from the sky. And the situation, I don't know whether you know this famous picture, it is of the fall of Icarus, the little boy in the sky is falling down, and here is the ploughman, the peasant, what is doing? He's ploughing, working. And there is a ship, they are sailing. And nobody takes care of this poor, poor boys. And now, uh, so, so, the, the lines by, written by Odin, uh, in Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The ploughman, the peasant, the ploughman, uh, Pfüger, may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun, the sun shone as it had uh, two on the white legs disappearing into the green water. And the expensive, delicate ship must have been something amazing. Now the shipmen, uh, they must be, have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky. But it had some where, uh, somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Uh, the peasant uh, doesn't take care of the shipmen too. Like the sun, there is shining all things, but the poor boy is falling out of the sky, something happening, something surprising is happening. It is overseen, overlooked by all the uh, uh, people uh, present there. Um, as phenomenology says and poetry shows, ethics are deeply involved into the work of our senses. Paying attention uh, to what strikes and touches us seems to be ethically overdetermined. 
the attention we are living through surpasses our own projects and it surpasses the various techniques and practices by which our attentive behavior is modeled. If there is any primary form of attention, that will be my last sentence, if there is any primary form of attention which plays its special role in the genesis of the world, we must admit that it keeps certain features of a savage attention in a similar sense as Levi Stoss speaks of a savage thinking. There's also a savage attention which is never completely domesticated and normalized by all techniques. Uh, I thank you.